Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's This Is Me webinar on This Is Me for Small Businesses. For those of you who I haven't yet met, my name is Robin Vernon Harcourt, and I'm a Senior Programme Manager at the Lord Mayor's Appeal and lead on our This Is Me initiative. Before we start, and as we wait for a few more people to join us, I'm just going to cover a few housekeeping points so that we can really make the most of our time together. You'll notice that your video and your microphone will be on mute. That's the case for the majority of the webinar, but we do have the Q&A function. So please do feel free to use that and post any questions that you have for us and our speakers throughout the webinar. And of course, if you need any, any help or have any technical issues, if you send a message in the chat, our team will be able to help you. And we are recording today's webinar, so we can share this with you afterwards and do feel free to share with any colleagues who weren't able to join us today. And of course, if you'd like to tweet and, and share with us on social media, then please do feel free and you will see our hashtags on the slides there. So great, so this is our fifth webinar in our This Is Me series for 2020. And really the purpose of today is to share how This Is Me can be used in a small business context to really support you to deliver your mental health work. And we're gonna provide some really practical examples of how you can do this today. And that is why we're absolutely delighted to have our two speakers, Richard Martin from Burn Dean and Ian Parks for, from Elba joining us here today both who have such a great range and depth of experience, both in a small business context and using This Is Me and other mental health support. Before I hand over to our speakers, I'm gonna give a short introduction into what This Is Me is and why we should look to use the This Is Me tools and the change it can bring about in your workplace. And then we will have a Q&A session with both of our speakers. And that's really an opportunity to ask any more of your questions and really get their expertise. So at its core, This Is Me supports organizations to end the stigma around mental health in the workplace, really to create healthier and more inclusive cultures to improve employee wellbeing. And, and we provide a number of tools that organizations can use to do that which you can see on the slide is our green ribbon campaign, This Is Me Storytelling and Wellbeing in the Workplace. So the green ribbon campaign is really focused on supporting organizations to raise awareness of the importance of supporting mental health in their workplace. And we provide tools and resources and encourage organizations to get on board during Mental Health Awareness Week and World of Mental Health Day, which we've just had. And this is really to create a, a visible sign of support, a visible community that is committed to supporting mental health, which really demonstrates to those that might be struggling, you know, that it's okay not to be okay. And it also really signifies to your workplace and to your employees that you as a business are really supported to supporting the mental health of your people and your team. We took the Green Ribbon campaign online this year to uh, build that community and that support, even though whilst we are apart physically, we can still be together and prioritize our mental health. Secondly, our uh, This Is Me storytelling really supports organizations to encourage their employees to share their lived experience of mental health. And this is really to open up the conversation to dispel those myths and challenge some of those stereotypes that unfortunately we still too often sometimes see associated with mental health. This can be done in a number of ways, whether that's creating a This Is Me film or using other people's films, sharing stories on blogs or, or even in one-to-one -one conversations or in team meetings. And if you register for This Is Me or if you have, we provide a toolkit that really provides step-by-step -step guidance on how you can start to think about creating a, a storytelling campaign in your workplace and what that might look like for your context. 
And thirdly, we support organisations to build the skills and confidence of their employees to have conversations around mental health and really be able to look after themselves and to be able to look after one another, which we know is a bit more challenging now that we may be working uh, remotely. So we developed an e-learning tool in partnership with Samaritans, which really brings their expertise in the workplace and helps build the skills of employees to know how to start conversations about mental health and to support one another. And there's also a really great range of resources that you can use as part of this tool to, to use in your team meetings and to start those conversations. So that's a range of tools that different organisations can use depending on their priorities or depending on your context. And before we look onto how we can use some of these tools in a more of a small business context, I just wanted to share with you why we should focus on this is me at all or why we should focus on this culture piece around reducing stigma. And the reason for this is because we know it works. And we know from our research, both with um, larger businesses and smaller businesses that are signed up to This Is Me, that This Is Me and in particular storytelling has a direct impact on increasing awareness, encouraging more people to talk openly about mental health and challenging stereotypes and reducing stigma, which you can see from some of the statistics from our 2019 survey here. But we also know that This Is Me and in particular storytelling can act as a real catalyst for change across an organisation as a whole and really build a strong foundation upon which then to build your wider mental health work. And we know this because we measure organisations that register with This Is Me um, across these 10 measures, which you can see on the screen. And we really believe that as an organisation is achieving seven or more of these measures, they are making really sustainable and tangible progress in how their organisation thinks and acts around mental health. Again, from our 2019 survey, we found that only 27% of organisations or 28% of organisations were achieving seven or more measures before they did This Is Me and storytelling. Then when we went back to look at those same organisations that had done This Is Me and had shared stories, we found that 87% of them were now um, achieving and delivering seven or more of those measures. So it really has the ability to bring lasting change to your organisation. And that's why we are so delighted to have so many of you on the call today and be able to really see how this can support your business and your context. So before we hand over to our first speaker, I'd really love to get a sense of where the organisations on the call are at with your experience with This Is Me. Is this something that you've done some of the tools already or is this your sort of first look at This Is Me and how it might support you? So you should see a poll on your screen now and we'll give a 30 seconds or so for everyone to look at, uh, to share with us what activity, if any, that you have done already under This Is Me. Brilliant, we can see some of those results coming in. I'll give a, another couple of seconds for anyone who hasn't voted and would like to. Okay, great. So let's see the results of this poll. Brilliant. So there's quite a, an even spread among the uh, options there. So about a quarter of organisations have done the green ribbon, uh, just under a quarter storytelling and well-being in the workplace and, a, and a, a good proportion of you who have done none at the moment as well. So that's really interesting for us to see where we're at at this snapshot. And hopefully throughout uh, the course of this webinar, we'll be able to give you some really practical support to look at using some of the other tools as well. And just before we move on, it would be really great to understand both from those organisations who have done This Is Me um, activity, but also for you who are, haven't done anything at the moment but would like to, what is the biggest challenge that you might be facing or you think you might face in doing this? And what I would um, really ask people to do is to put those challenges or those questions in the Q&A function 
And that means that everyone can see those challenges and that if somebody puts a challenge that you think, oh yes, actually that's what we're facing as well, you can like that um, question and, um, and then that will move it up in the, uh, in, the, in the order where we'll have more chance to address that both with our speakers, but also at the Q&A at the end. So please do feel free to do that through throughout the webinar and share some of those challenges that you might be facing or might think you might face. So I am now delighted to introduce our first speaker, Richard Martin, who is a director at Burn Dean and also the co-chair of our London This Is Me steering group. And Richard has a, a wealth of experience, both with This Is Me, but also supporting small businesses on their mental health agenda. So we are delighted to have you today, Richard, and thank you for your time. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So before we get into some of these, these questions and looking at some of those challenges that small businesses might be facing, it would be great if you could, for our audience, just introduce yourself and share a bit about your background. Yep, lovely. So uh, I'm a dad. I've got three kids who are now 18, 20, 22. Um, I spent 28, 20 odd years as an employment lawyer in the city uh, and then had a massive mental health issue myself. So a big kind of breakdown led to hospitalization and other things. Uh, so a bit of a change of tack after that. Uh, and now I work, I work in small business. Uh, we are a workplace consultancy. We do lots of training around workplace culture. Uh, and within that, we do an awful lot of work around mental health awareness and, and um, mental health wellbeing generally in the workplace. So uh, within that context, I do quite a lot of storytelling um, and uh, also kind of on the back of being involved with This Is Me, wrote a book as well which, about my experience of mental illness, which again um, was a kind of useful insight into storytelling. Um, yeah, uh, and as you say, I'm, and I'm proud to, to co-chair the steering committee of This Is Me. So. Great, thank you, Richard, that was great. And um, as you said, as, as someone who works for, both works for a small business, but also advises other small businesses, what are, what are some of those common challenges that you find small businesses have, both when they're looking to either start or continue their mental health work, um, or looking at storytelling and some of the tools under This Is Me? So I think various things one could say. I think, first of all, one always has to start with the culture of the organization. and and small organizations have benefits and and i guess drawbacks in a sense because if you think about a small organization very often the there'll be some central figures perhaps the founder who very much sort of sets the tone for the organization which can be a really positive thing if that person is is on board and on side and and, and contributing to this but on the other hand can be a can be a, a hindrance if if they're perhaps less less willing to embrace this kind of agenda so i think um size i think one of the things which can tend, can often hold people back is a sense that if I'm going to do something, I have to do a marvelous, great big thing. You know, we look at the wonderful, beautiful corporate videos that Barclays and PwC and, and the Bank of England and others produce, and we think, oh my goodness, you know, if I have to do something, then it has to look like that, and I haven't got the time or the budget or the know-how, uh, and so that holds holds them back. Um, and so I guess I'd say. I would always try and encourage organizations of any size, but particularly smaller organizations to, to reflect on what's the purpose of this. Um, what we're trying to do and what the This Is Me campaign is all about is around reducing the stigma, as you said earlier on. Um, and that can be done in so many different ways. And what we kind of, I think, need to keep in mind is that that's our purpose. There's some wonderful resources that the campaign provides that can be a really good support and assistance to organizations doing work but don't let that be a constraint if that makes sense um so the you know the, the beautiful well-produced corporate videos that we see are wonderful um but an honest frank conversation with somebody over a cup of coffee can be just as impactful and just as long lasting as, as those videos yeah, it's, it's a great point, absolutely, in terms of understanding the culture um, of your business and how small business cultures do tend to be different from your large, your big corporate um, cultures, potentially. And I think it's really interesting what you said, the role of individuals and your leaders and your founders um, in supporting that work as well. I think that's really interesting. And if a, a small business were in that sort of um, 
position where they were like, we want to get started on this and we're not quite sure how to go about it. And like you said, potentially feeling intimidated by some of the work that these big organizations do. How would you advise they get started? If you were to share maybe three, three steps on how they could get started, what would that look like? Um, so wear a green ribbon. Get a hold of a green ribbon and wear it. The, um, the number of conversations that have been sparked by people stopping me, random strangers stopping me on the tube to say, what's that ribbon you're wearing? Um, so if random strangers can ask the question, if you're doing it in a workplace, you know, your colleagues will too. So I think that's a good place to start. Um, I always say one of the one of the stats that we always use around mental illness, that one in four of us in the course of any one year will experience a diagnosable mental, Ill mental illness, which is a sobering stat. But what it does mean is that all of us have got a story. Um, it may not be us directly, but it's somebody pretty close to us. So what I would encourage people to do is think about what your story is. And it doesn't have to be a dramatic story of you know, massive burnout and whatever. You know. it, it can be a gen very gentle story. And there are stories going on right now. Uh, which COVID, I think, provides a really good opportunity to communicate with each other on a very human level to say, actually, you know what, this is hard. And I'm finding this aspect of it particularly hard, or I'm finding this part of it brilliant, or whatever it may be. So I think, think about what your stories might be. I'm going to give you four, so if, if, forgive me. Um, the uh, third one, just try out when somebody says, how are you? try out telling them just just try what it feels like to actually say to answer that question honestly um and if you ask somebody else how are you and they just give you the normal glib fine just go back and say no no no, i, I meant it really how are you um and then finally i was struck by something on bbc the other day uh so freddie flintoff um england cricketer was on bbc talking about his experience of bulimia and, and sometimes things like that could be a really good opportunity to start a conversation, to say, you know, to somebody over a coffee or whatever it is, did you see that thing last night? Freddie Flintoff, Freddie Flintoff, I mean, Freddie, you know, and it, it could be a really good way of just starting a conversation. Um, I know from my own experience of when I was first ill and started talking to friends about it, um, the, the number of people who said, well, you don't know, you don't know this about me, Richard, but I've got a mother who this, or I've got a friend or a dad or a brother or me or whatever. And it was extraordinary the number of things that came out just because we started the conversation. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. And I like the idea of using whether that story is in uh, the kind of public sphere or, or well-known celebrities or, you know, just having that, starting that conversation. And it's so interesting, isn't it? And I don't know if it's a, a cultural thing in, in Britain that we're like, oh, how are you? Yeah, fine. How are you? And it's it's almost like a hello rather than a no, actually, like, how are you doing? What's what's going on for you? So I think that's a great point that all of us individually, but in our, in our workplaces as, as well, can look to do more. And I think it's quite rude, actually, that we pretty much every other question we ask that we are that, that people ask of us, we do actually stop and answer honestly. Yeah, it's actually quite rude to just to ignore the question or to lie. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, it's it's definitely interesting, definitely. And I think it's about being, you know, having that vulnerability, isn't it? And like you said, COVID provides that real opportunity at the moment where we, you know, we might not all be in the same boat, but we're potentially experiencing the same storm. So it's an opportunity for us to connect with people there and, and show a bit of that vulnerability that might have been more difficult previously for lots of people. Mm -hmm. And I guess, Richard, when, when thinking about some of these, uh, some of the small businesses that you've worked with, could you share with us uh, a couple of examples where you think uh, small businesses have done really great work on their mental health and, and how they went about doing that? A couple of kind of practical examples, whether that's using This Is Me or, or other activity that they've done. So, I guess... The, I'm going to start with us, um, because that's an obvious place to start. And I know we're an odd organisation because we do, we work with groups all the time. We are leading conversations, we're leading training um, all the time. Um, but the first time that we decided that we were going to kind of focus on mental health as a business, we hired a, um, 
uh, a hall in King's College on the Strand. That sounds very grand. It didn't cost very much. Uh, and we emailed a load of clients and said, look, we, we're gonna, we want to talk about something. Um, would you come along and listen um, and be part of it? And so, I don't know, 50 or 60 people came along. And, 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 and that was the first time that I spoke publicly about my experience. And, the, and we as an organization had really kind of put out our stool to say, no, we are gonna talk about mental health. And that was back in was 2014. Um, and the, the impact of that was enormous. I mean, I, I was absolutely terrified beforehand, inevitably. Um, and, and I probably didn't realize just how terrified I was until I had finished and then felt absolutely drained and could hardly stand. But the, the enormity of the support that was around me from complete strangers, as well as from my team, was huge. So that was, I mean, and, and that, as I say, that, that I think probably changed overnight the, the, the conversation within Berndine, but also the conversations that we were having with our clients about this stuff, because suddenly it became something that we can talk about. And we know that that is what storytelling does. It just breaks through the, the barriers and creates that emotional connection. Um, at a very different level, when people get together for a social or whatever it may be, something that I've seen work really well is just, and we do it in other ways to say, tell me something that we don't know about you. And that provides an opportunity for people in the team to, if they want to, or perhaps you as the leader or whatever it may be, could doing this to say, and I'm going to deliberately now take the opportunity to say, okay, you don't know about this, this about me, but here's a story that I've got. Um, mm -hmm. And as I say, the, uh, a lot of that is about, well, that, that second example is, is, is about not letting perfection, if you like, get in the way of doing something, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And I think there's a, I think it's Brené Brown who uh, shares a brilliant quote that says, I'm a recovering perfectionist and uh, uh, do, do good enough in practice or, or it's yeah. Yeah. Said better than that, but it's a, uh, yeah, it's a really great, um, great idea, isn't it? And I think moving away from leadership feeling that they need to be perfect and strong all the time and actually demonstrating and role modelling that vulnerability as well is really important. And also, I think that you, that, that to tell a story, you have to have a, an enormous, great, thrilling, dramatic yeah. story. You don't. You just have to be able to say, yeah, this is me. This is what yeah. I'm like. Well, Richard, that probably is a, a perfect place to uh, draw our conversation to a close, even though we could absolutely carry on for much longer. But of, of course, we have an opportunity to do so in the Q&A as well. So thank you so much for sharing your experience with us and your tips there. That was really fantastic. And it links really nicely to introducing our second speaker, Ian Parks, Chief Executive of Elba. Uh, Ian uh, has and Elba have done fantastic work at Elba using This Is Me to support their mental health work. And Ian's really gonna share how they went about that and really give some practical ideas that hopefully can inspire and support many of you on the call to look at how you can um, do the same and, and build on the work that you've already done. So thank you so much, Ian, for being with us and I will pass over to you. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this this morning. Um, so I'm the Chief Executive of Elba. East London Business Alliance. And just to give you some idea of our size, we're a small organization or small stroke medium, about 40 people with a turnover of about um, 3 million. We are a limited company, but we're also a registered charity. And our job, our purpose is to work with the corporate organizations in the city in Canary Wharf and link them to uh, social issues that we're tackling in East London. And when we are looking at this journey that we've made with This Is Me, there were two factors that really um, pushed us or pulled us towards getting involved. One was positive, one was not so positive. So the positive one is that we're working with a lot of corporates who have, as we've heard from Robin and from Richard, who are involved in thinking about mental well-being and welfare for their employees. And we were thinking about how we could take that commitment and apply it in the community, but also how we could do something similar um, in our own organisation. The negative factor was about four, four and a half years ago, we had a difficult case with a member of staff who had uh, mental health issues originating in the personal life, but was spilling over into professional life. And we tried as best we could to help that person, but it was a very, very difficult case. And so we stopped and thought, how can we do better? 
Is there something we can learn that we can do that would be appropriate to our size and our budget? And um, we often joke that our finance director, he can say no in at least 60 international languages. So it had to fit with, with what we could afford. So what did we do? So we started off by um, signing up to Time to Change or um, um, Time to Talk. And then we did exactly what Richard said. We, we chimed in with the Green Ribbon Campaign and Mental Health Awareness Week. I think this is about three and a half, four years ago. And we bought the green ribbons and we encouraged everybody to, to wear it. And we were doing that internally with a week of activity and we were doing it externally with our work in the community. So taking uh, people from the corporate organizations and working with um, community organizations. And um, we made use of the This Is Me videos. So the ones which the large corporates have done. And we use those in staff meetings to show the bravery and courage of those people talking about their mental health issues. But we decided not to do a storytelling video ourselves. And that's because as a small organization, we didn't think there was a sufficient anonymity, anonymity for anybody who did one of those videos. Every single person would know that of that person. It would be just a bit too personal. So um, I'd just like to say thank you to all those people from the large corporates who did those videos because we've been using them and they've been enormously helpful on our journey. Um, one of the most important things that we did was set up a wellbeing committee, which we call WELBA, and we've allowed that to be staff led and driven. I'm not on it. Um, uh, one of our members of staff chairs it. They have a monthly slot at our all team meetings. They have a monthly meeting themselves. They produce a monthly wellbeing letter, newsletter, and they have a program of activities. Now, at one point that was just happening in Mental Health Awareness Week, but after some staff uh, feedback, we now have activities happening across the whole year. And some of those things include um, bike rides and walk, uh, lunchtime walks, so the link between physical activity and wellbeing, lunchtime discussions on wellbeing issues. We've had workshops, um, which we've been able to get in from our business partners. So mindful workshops, mindfulness workshops. We've had arts and creativity uh, workshops, which to my mind looked a bit like year six art lesson, but nevertheless, a lot of people found it very helpful. We've had laughter yoga. We've had a therapy dog. Um, we had a gratitude log for the duration of uh, Mental Health Awareness Week. And all of those things have cost us little if nothing, although the dog uh, was pushing for a big fee for his appearance. We've had an employee assistance program. We've had a helpline associated with that. Um, we've had people go off and do mental health first aid training, which we got for free um, and which is freely available quite often from the um, NHS organizations in your area. I led the way on that, so I'm a, I'm a trained mental health first aider. And if necessary, we've got individual counseling. And when we looked at this maybe four years ago, individual counseling was practically the only thing we could move to. And that's where it gets really expensive. Um, and all the other things that we've done, all the practical things we've done, are actually free or very low cost. We have ongoing discussions now. We've used the five steps to well-being. We've had we've highlighted those in different staff meetings. So I've talked about um, being in the moment and what I do every day. Well, when I used to walk to work, what I used to do every day on the walk to work. We added well-being to our staff survey. So we have an annual staff survey, and we added a well-being session to the, section to that. And that allowed um, our HR apprentice, who was going through apprenticeship at the time, to add, do, do a dissertation around that. So the first question we asked was, um, do you think Elba's committed to your well-being at work? And we had a positive response of just under 80% and maybe from 18% and just one person saying no. People felt personally resilient. People felt that they were people were looking out for each other, particularly in their individual teams. Um, it was interesting for us to note that people linked how they were feeling personally, resilient wise, to the financial health of the organization. So as a result, we stepped up the financial feedback that we gave in each team meeting about our current financial situation. Um, people were concerned about staff turnover. So we explained more about when people were leaving, why they were leaving and where they were going on to. But the biggest thing that particularly came up, which was difficult, was workload stress. And that was a concern for a majority of people. And so we've talked about it more. So we talk about it more in team meetings and in individual team meetings. Um, 
We stepped up our use of interns and work experience people to try and relieve some of the workload stress. And we've worked hard on thinking about work-life balance. Um, and people talked about some flexibility about working from home as being welcome. So we've done some specific workshops on workload stress. One workshop to look at how you manage your time and think about how you prioritize. And one workshop just to look at when your workload is too big for the time you've got available, how do you manage the stress associated with it? And we've given more clarity on flexible working, completely overtaken, of course, by working from home during COVID. So those are some of the practical things. So the key points that I think we learned from all of that were, number one, there's got to be a very public commitment to well-being and positive mental health in the workplace. Secondly, that's got to come from the top, from myself, but also it comes from our trustees. Now, our board is made up of non-executives, um, but on there we do we do have the, um, or had the chair of East London Foundation Trust, which was the mental health um, NHS body for our area. So, of course, we had very strong support there. But the most important thing is practical. So that the practical activities that demonstrate to your staff that you're committed to well-being, but which also help them uh, in managing their well-being and get into a good place and promotes the conversation. So a lunchtime walk is not just a walk. A lunchtime walk is also a conversation. Coming into lockdown, we felt that we were in a good place with our culture and with our well-being. And so well-being was a very common topic of conversation across our organization. So that as we know that uh, working from home has been stressful, being isolated has been stressful, being concerned about the future, we were already in a place where we could actually have that uh, conversation about well-being and how are you um, quite easily. So our conversations very often start with how are you? And also quite often we're asking, what do you need? Uh, and people know not to ask for things which are very expensive for people asking for things which are reasonable and within a, in a budget but it's a normal topic of conversation we've stepped up our practical activity so we've had online quizzes zumba stretching sessions cooking lessons we extended the gratitude log from mental health awareness week to something which um, happens every month now we have tea and chat um Prior to this uh, London moving into the second tier, we had working from home buddies so that people would meet up. We've had walking meetings. We've had meetings where people are still on the phone, but everyone goes to the park. Something which just breaks up our activity and has got a really strong focus on well-being. But the, the last thing I want to talk about really in terms of what's prompted us to do something about well-being was the death of George Floyd on the 25th of May. And so we have a very diverse uh, workforce, um, 47%. And so we acknowledged the well-being issues that that provoked. And um, we had to acknowledge it because our people were telling us about it. And I'm not sure that we would have had such strong feedback if we hadn't had that positive culture. We created a safe space to discuss the issues around mental well-being arising from George Floyd. We set up a new uh, inclusion, inclusion and uh, equalities group. And we really stepped up our lunchtime documentary and discussion issues. So we 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 find a documentary, we encourage people to watch it, and then we have a, an hour long discussion. And that has really brought out um, people's um, sense of justice, injustice. People have talked a lot more about their personal stories and mental health stories and wellbeing stories provoked by that than possibly were provoked by the Green Ribbon campaign. So it's been a very helpful addition to our culture. So finally, just thinking about the impact of this is me. Um, we've used the resources, we've used the green ribbon, we've used the videos, and um, we've used the, the links to the uh, things like the uh, Samaritans uh, welfare, well-being in the workplace issues. But if we looked at the seven steps that Robin brought up on the slide at the beginning, I think four years ago, we probably weren't hitting any of those. But I just was just reading through it when Robin brought the slide up. I think we're probably hitting nearly all of them now, if not all of them. So we're probably all 10. Um, and during this period of lockdown, we've used the, we haven't been able to use the physical aspects, but we've used the digital materials and the links and resources. And we've also, over the years, used the meetings and events. Um, our staff have been encouraged to go to the breakfast so they can talk to their peers, particularly our colleagues from the Wellbeing Committee. So in terms of impact, I think we've got a more open culture. It's helped shift the culture to where the culture I'm trying to create for the organisation anywhere about, anyway, about devolved leadership and more agency for everybody to uh, be involved in how their work gets delivered. Um, I think we're pretty transformed from four years ago. 
We've going into COVID, we've had a fantastic spirit of togetherness that we're getting through a tough time together. And I think in terms, just in terms of a more um, hard hitting uh, measure is that we think the time saved. So it sounds, sound, might sound like spending a lot of time on well-being, but however, if we think, of, if I think back to how much time we spent on a difficult case and the hours and hours of senior leadership time that that took up compared to the spreading across the organizations that everybody's involved in the conversation, I think that's a very uh, good trade-off. And it's been great for us. It's it just it's a real natural part of our culture. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Ian, thank you so much. I can't believe how much co content you covered in that time. And I think that's testament to the amazing work that you've been doing um, with Elba um, in Elba over the last uh, four, four years, as you said. And really interesting to see how you started, like Richard was mentioning, starting small with the green ribbon and then how you've used that and the storytelling films to really build that foundation and build on that. Um, really interesting to see, yeah, how that's grown from, as you said, activity around those key dates to a, a sustained and continued program of activity as well. Um, and I, I particularly loved the therapy dog as well as a practical idea for, for us. Um, but I really loved what you said about how all of this work has really put you as an organisation in a much stronger position when dealing with the challenges of this year, whether that's um, COVID or the impact, as you said, that racism and institutional racism has on mental health and encouraging people to, to share their experiences there. So thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. I'm sure we will have lots of questions for both you and Richard. So I will welcome Richard back uh, onto the screen as well for our Q&A. And as I said, please do put any questions that you have in the Q&A function and we will address as many of those as we have time for. Great, so hopefully Richard will be joining us. Fantastic, so I can see you both on the screen, so hopefully everybody um, can as well. So we've got a, a question here from Caroline, um, which says, how does This Is Me align with the mind mental health at work commitment? Are they linked? So I'll, I'll just address that one quickly and I'll pass over to Richard and Ian for any of your thoughts as well. Um, but absolutely, This Is Me is a tool that can help you achieve the mental health at work commitment, particularly around standard three, that is around creating that open culture about mental health and providing support and tools for your employees to do so. Um, so as, a, uh, as an aside, MIND is also running a webinar series to look at how organisations can implement each of those standards um, over the next month or so. And we're sharing some more work around This Is Me on a webinar on Monday if you are interested in joining that one as well. Um, but Richard and, and Ian, from your side, I think you've both given us some, some great um, ideas around that already, but maybe sharing some of your reflections about how This Is Me supports um, as you mentioned, Ian, the time to change pledge, and that's now sort of been encompassed in the mental health at work commitment as well. Um, I, I think I would just add a small piece in, in, in supporting what you said, Robin, that the, there, are, there, there are a lot of kind of initiatives and commitments and things out there. And sometimes it can feel confusing, particularly for a, a small employer. And I guess what I would say is go back to the basics, that it's not a question of what you've ticked and, and what you've signed up to and all the rest of it. It's about, um, and, and, and I guess echoing what Ian was saying, it's about what have you changed in, in the culture in your organization? Is this an organization where the well-being of people um, is, is, is nurtured and promoted as being a good thing in itself? Um, and I'm just going to, if I may, just pick up a question, a separate question that came up. It's in the chat. Um, um, I, Mike was asking about is is this is me just for London? Um, and the answer is this is me. Well, sorry, the question was is this is this is this is me just for businesses in London? This is me is for employers. Um, so you don't have to be a, a business. Um, but uh, and we have it began in London, but there are. Um, movements, there are groups, there are um, steering committees operating in a number of different regions throughout the UK, as well as internationally. Um, what we've done in terms of kind of broadening and rolling it out is to say that we know that what 
works in London might be quite particular to London. So much better to have a local group of people operating in the Northeast, in Scotland, wherever it may be, to say, look, you know what works in your environment. So um, we can support you and help you and give you tools and all sorts of other things, but um, your best place to drive things forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Richard. Okay, so um, we, we, we've looked at a number of these sort of standards. So um, the mayor's good business standard, the healthy workplace standard. So we've not gone for the mine, we, you know, we're committed to time to talk. We have used the mine materials in particular, the five steps to mental wellbeing or five components of mental wellbeing has been fantastically helpful because it's very, very practical. And so we thought about how we can do different practical things. Just picking up on a couple of other questions that come up in the Q&A. So Chris has asked, how long do we go out for for a walk? Well, we go out for about an hour. And that just coincides with our location because we're on Millwall Harbour and it takes about an hour to walk all the way around. And we generally stop on a bench and have a uh, sandwich as we go around. Um, Jenny has asked what the biggest challenge was. And I think our biggest challenge in a small organisation is credibility. So have we, do the staff really believe that we are committed to their well-being, or do they think we're just talking some old chat? And I think the most important thing for us has been to pass across the ownership of the well-being committee to the staff and to try and get everybody engaged in that. And I think um, so I think you're sending a question, you know, is senior buy management buy-in uh, not the most difficult thing? Well, for not not for us, because it came from me. Um, the, the thing has been has been to, to try and can be genuine and authentic about what we're doing. And you know, the fact that only 80% said that, that we were that they were convinced at this moment that that we were committed to their well-being says we've still got 20% to do. They were all on most of them were maybes, but you know, we still got some work to do. So I think that's our journey. That's really interesting, Ian. And I guess um, like you've clearly demonstrated that commitment and that drive came from you. Um, Richard, perhaps you could comment on if it was the other way around of being employee led, how in small businesses, employees could work to get that support of their, their senior leaders. Well, yes, there's, 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 there's interesting questions being asked kind of the other way around as well in, in the, in the Q&A, I think. Um, so uh, I'm going to mention the, the example of a well-known search engine. Um, there are others available. Um, I won't mention them by name, but um, we might know their name. Um, and their mental health initiative, which is now very big, began with some members of staff putting a, it was a blue circular sticker on their name badge. And nobody organized it, nobody auth authorized it at board level, there was no big HR initiative. One person did it, and then some more people started doing it. And after a while, the organization thought we need to put some structure around it but it was a very simple statement to say i'm open in the same way the green ribbon is it's to say i'm 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 open for a conversation about mental health and well-being um there was there is there are lots of ways in which one could think about getting senior level buy-in um, and there are lots of different kind of um, lenses that one could use to say why is this important um ian was talking about the overlap between engagement and mental health and certainly you know, those two things absolutely go hand in hand. And we know that business productivity goes hand in hand with engagement from a more risk perspective, as Ian was saying, when you, particularly in a small organization, if you do have a, a mental health issue, that can take all sorts of time and energy uh, and distraction. Um, and so there are lots of risk-based reasons why getting this right is really important. Um, the, I guess, well, in the, the, the time to change, um, sorry, Thriving at Work report in 2017, Deloitte there and, and afterwards have done a lot of work in sort of putting, putting the, the financial numbers in place to show the return on investment, that for every pound that is invested in mental health and well-being in the workplace, there is a substantially increased return. Now that's sometimes put at four, it's sometimes put at seven, it's sometimes put as 10 times the original investment, but there is consistently a very strong return on investment. Um, and one final question, just picking up Chrissy's question about um, male dominated environments. I think it's a very good question. One of the, and I'm going to answer it in two ways, I think. I absolutely get that, um, you know, a load of blokes might not appreciate yoga or even a therapy dog. Um, two examples, and both are about storytelling. So I've, I've gone into lots of male or dominated environments myself of different kinds, some quite 
um, uh, manual in nature, factories, warehouses, some um, offices. Uh, but me as a bloke saying, yeah, I'm a, I'm a father and a husband and this is what, ha and a brother and a son and whatever, and this is what happened to me, does just break things down. Another example is, is using celebrities. So I mentioned Freddie Flintoff earlier on. Uh, the, and and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious, obviously, that small businesses can't afford big speaker fees. You can just look at the video. Um, one of the most amazing moments I saw in one of the clients I work with, which is a, they're an investment bank. Um, and they had Clark Carlisle, who he's a footballer. He was a professional footballer. Uh, he worked, played for a number of different clubs. And he came in and spoke about uh, his experience of mental health problems, including at least one suicide attempt. And they filled a 200 seat room with blokes talking about emotions and mental health in the workplace. It was extraordinary. That was several years ago, but it was a, that was a real kind of turning point for them as a, an organization. Thanks, Richard. And Ian, do you have any thoughts just to, just to close our Q and A as we're almost sure. out of time? Just to come back to Chrissy's point, I think there is a gender issue here. And you're absolutely right, Chrissy. Um, I didn't think of inviting the therapy dog in, nor the laughter yoga. It was the well-being committee that did that. And that's a good thing from our perspective. So I've been able to recognize that I don't necessarily have that 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 inner dialogue. And but to draw in everybody, to open it up to the staff, it does mean that we can um, put on practical activities to meet everybody's needs. Cycling and walking was much more attractive, but we have been able to talk very, very openly about whether the activities that we lay on and the newsletter and the stories we talk about, whether there's a gender issue, whether men like to see stories in one way or another. But we wouldn't have been able to have that conversation if we hadn't started to change our culture. And, you know, if we go back right to start when we said, right, okay, all staff meeting, here's a green ribbon for everybody. Now watch these two videos and everybody of every gender dabbing their eyes at the end of those videos. You know what, if you've seen a This Is Me uh, video, you know it's very, very hard to get through it without you get, getting choked yourself. And so, and then that starts to open up the conversation just like Richard said. Um, and then when we come to the death of George Floyd, um, our ability for our black colleagues to tell us exactly what it's been like for them even in an organization like ours, which is very diverse and pretty uh, pretty inclusive, what it's been like for them um, is all part of the culture we've been able to create. So we've been able to acknowledge that I would have not been able, as an older white male, I would have not been able to think about practical activities to respond to my black colleagues if we hadn't had the culture which was open about talking about mental health and well-being. So I think for me, it's all part of a piece. That's great. Ian, Richard, thank you so much um, for your time today and for answering so many of those questions. And thank you to everybody for continuing to join us and giving us a couple of extra minutes of your day. I know everyone is busy, so thank you for that. And just to wrap up, um, we would love to be able to get some of your feedback about this session, um, how it's worked, how it has been helpful or what we could do differently in future. And just before we close, I wanted to encourage anybody here who isn't registered for This Is Me to please do go to our website, um, which will come up on the slide shortly, to register. My contact details are also there if you'd like to have a follow-up conversation. Um, just to also share that on our YouTube page, we have our playlist of our This Is Me videos. They are all available to um, watch yourself individually or share with your teams as well. So please do use those as a tool as Ian and Richard have both mentioned as well. And then we also have our next webinar in our series, which is really about how can we keep momentum going and, and what's worked really well in businesses that we would love you to attend as well. Um, and that will hopefully give some, some ideas about how in this more challenging time, we can keep pushing this agenda forward and really keep prioritizing the mental health of our people. So a real final thank you to Richard and Ian. We really appreciate your time and everything that you've shared with us. And a very big thank you for all of you for attending. And I hope you have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you.